All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, VLE, uh, today's virtual learning experience. Um, this is on how to on um, linear models for differential expression analysis or how I learned to stop using T-test and love linear regression. Uh, my name is Akshay and uh, I work in the uh, School of Medicine and for the Center for Computational Thinking. Um, this topic is uh, near and dear to me, uh, both because I genuinely enjoy doing this kind of analysis and also because um, I struggled a little bit to understand these concepts when I was first introduced to them. So if you are new to this and you would like to apply this kind of analysis to your own data, um, I hope today's session will make things easier for you. Um, uh, I, I have, uh, so here I say differential expression. Uh, I also use the term differential abundance analysis because uh, these methods that we'll go over today can be applied not just to gene expression data like microarrays or RNA-seq data, but they can also be used, uh, applied to other things like metabolomics or proteomics. A um, uh, couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, the code for today's session, so today's session will be a mix of um, going through, uh, there'll be like a lecture component and there'll also be a code coding component. Uh, if you'd like, to have access to the code, uh, there's a link to the GitHub page with the code uh, in the description, which is uh, below uh, me. Um, and uh, But please don't feel any obligation to kind of code along. In fact, I would recommend just watching this uh, if you are watching this right now. And um, if you would like to uh, um, actually run and um, play around with the code, uh, I'd recommend doing that afterwards. Um, uh, at your own pace. And um, you can use this recording, uh, if you like, as a guide. Uh, there's another link in the description, and that's to um, a survey. Uh, so please fill it out, um, and uh, because I appreciate any feedback, good or bad. Uh, and if you do fill it out, your name will be entered into a prize draw. So that's exciting. Um, one final thing before I begin, uh, there's um, th there won't be any um, we won't really be going into the mathematical details of anything we talk about today, but I'll just be providing uh, relevant uh, high level statistical details. Okay, so a few goals for today. One is we're going to try to learn how to use linear models to quantify differential abundance for different experimental designs. Um, we will be using uh, this paper published in the journal F1000 Research, uh, and the link to that is also in the description. And that's a fantastic guide. Uh, it's a great paper because it shows you how to apply these linear models to um, experiments of uh, varying complexity. So we won't cover all the examples um, provided in the paper, but we'll, um, we will, we'll look at a, a handful. Uh, we're going to learn about the concept of design and contrast matrices. And we'll also learn the basics of the lemma package. And the lemma package is what we'll uh, use to perform this differential abundance analysis. Uh, so I say linear model. And when I say linear, linear model, I mean linear regression. So uh, here's a uh, refresher of what linear regression is. And um, in case you've never heard of it, this is a quick fire one slide introduction to linear regression. When people hear the term linear regression, or at least when I hear the term linear regression, I think of this. This is an example of what's known as simple linear regression. Uh, and in this case, you have a continuous uh, input and a continuous output. So uh, here you can see that we have horsepower plotted against displacement. Um, if you are at all familiar with R, you've probably come across the built-in data set empty cars. So these data were taken from that data set, and it just has um, data about different kinds of cars. Not particularly relevant to biology or not at all relevant, but uh, it provides a simple example. So here you can see there's a positive relationship between horsepower and displacement. Um, and this blue line here, the straight line, represents a simple linear regression model. And so the objective is to try to, quote, fit a line to these data that best explains these data. And what that means is you are trying to draw a straight line that minimizes the distance between um, that line and the individual data points. Again, I won't go into the details of fitting, but approximately you want um, to have a line that nicely models the data. And we can see that by eye, um, 
there's a positive relationship between uh, these two uh, variables. And the, our linear regression line uh, matches our um, uh, kind of intuition. So uh, looking at the details of this line, we, this line can be represented by this equation here. So horsepower is equal to intercept plus displacement times the slope. So that asterisk doesn't mean to the power of, it means um, times, multiplying. Alternatively, and this is kind of the more formal way of writing this uh, equation, you can say horsepower, which is the thing we want to uh, predict is a variable on the left hand side of the equation is equal to beta naught and beta naught or beta zero represents the intercept plus the displacement times beta one and beta one represents the slope. So what are these beta naught and beta one? So if we draw a, if we extend this blue line all the way to the y axis, we see that at some point it, um, when it hits the y-axis, the value at which it hits the y-axis, that is the uh, known as the intercept. And that's the, our beta naught. And beta one simply refers to the slope. So slope is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, right? So um, this is linear regression when you have a continuous input and a continuous output. How do we apply linear regression to more familiar cases? Uh, uh, for example, let's say we have two groups. Um, you can think of this as any two groups like uh, control and treatment or um, uh, wild type and mutant. Um, and we want to compare the expression of a particular gene um, between these two groups. So we can use linear regression for this. So um, this plot shows on the y-axis, again, we have a continuous variable. So in this case, it's um, expression for something called gene A, whatever your favorite gene is. But the x-axis no longer corresponds to a continuous variable. It corresponds to what's known as a categorical variable. So a categorical variable, um, as opposed to a continuous variable, uh, can take on only a finite number of values. So in this case, our categorical variable takes on one of two values, zero representing group, the first group. So like I said, for example, um, control and one representing the second group. So for example, treatment. And so this should be quite familiar. If you've ever uh, quantified gene expression in two different groups, you would plot it something like this. Um, so here we have a box plot that shows you the expression in group zero and the expression in group one. And by I, we can tell that there's a pretty big difference. So if this were um, treatment versus control, um, just by I, you would, it would suggest that um, your treatment is having some kind of effect on the expression of gene A. On this plot, you also see two red circles. And the two red circles represent the means of these two groups. So how, do, uh, how does linear regression that we just saw um, relate to these types of data? So starting with the model that we would fit to for these data, let's, um, let's start with that model and then try to understand what each component of that model means. So just as we saw previously on the previous slide, we had horsepower is equal to beta one plus displacement times, sorry, beta naught plus displacement times beta one. Here we have gene A is equal to beta naught plus group times beta one. So what's beta naught? Beta naught again corresponds or is the intercept. In the case of categorical variables, in this specific case, the intercept takes on a special meaning. And the intercept corresponds to the mean value of group zero. So meaning in this case, the mean of gene A gene A's expression in group zero. Now you might wonder, it's kind of strange, like why is beta zero the intercept here? It isn't the intercept the point at which your line, which actually I haven't drawn here, I will draw it here. Isn't that the point where the linear regression line touches the y-axis? Well, it does. Because if you look at this here, beta zero, the red circle, the lower on the lower left-hand side, if you look at its x value, x-axis value, its x-axis value is zero, implying that it does in fact intersect with the y-axis. It's not super clear here that that is in fact the case, and that's just because it's easier to plot it like this. 
But strictly speaking, that red dot and that box plot should be lie on top of the y-axis. So that's beta zero. What does beta one mean? Beta one means the same thing that it meant on the previous slide. It's the slope. But here the slope has a slightly, um, uh, so, so uh, the slope here means the difference between the mean of group one and the mean of group zero. Now, when you think of slope, you think of something that's like this, like on the previous slide. But here, this is just a vertical difference, um, which at first doesn't make sense. But if you look at the, um, uh, the, the formula for computing the slope, it's in this case, y2 minus y1, which is the mean of group one minus the mean of group zero, divided by x2 minus x1. But x2 here is 1 and uh, x1 is 0. So 1 minus 0 is 1. So even though it's uh, like a, a vertical distance, um, this is still the slope because the denominator turns out to be 1. Um, now, why, is, why does beta 0 correspond to the, the mean of group 1, whereas beta 1 corresponds to the difference in these two means? That just happens to be what that ends up happening being the case when you fit a line that um, best fits these data. It just works out like that. So just to recap, once you fit this model, if you wanted to work out the mean expression of uh, gene A in group zero, you would do beta zero plus replace your group with zero times beta one. So the mean of gene A in group zero just ends up being beta zero. And similarly, if you wanted to work out what, the, what your model thinks is the uh, mean expression of gene A in group one, you would then do, again do beta zero plus and replace group with one. So it just ends up being beta zero plus beta one. But recall that beta zero is the mean of gene A in group zero and beta one is the difference in the expression between group one and group zero. That's a lot. If this is your first time considering simple linear regression in the context of categorical variables, this might, uh, might be confusing. I know I found it confusing. Um, so um, hopefully, as we kind of revisit this concept, um, this will make sense. And of course, this is being recorded. So if it still doesn't make sense, uh, you know, please review it afterwards. Uh, and of course, uh, I didn't say this before, but please email me with any uh, questions that you, you might still have. Uh, so, all right, so we did all of this. We fit the model and now we are estimating this beta zero, beta one. I told you what these beta zero and beta one mean. Um, kind of where are we going with this? What is the point of this in the context of what you are likely interested in, differential expression analysis? Um, well, once we have estimated these beta zero and beta ones, we can then do t-tests on them. So the t-test on beta zero is not that interesting. It's just asking if the mean expression in group A, uh, group zero, is significantly different from zero. That's typically not an interesting question to ask. The t-test on beta one though, that's the thing that we are all typically interested in because it's asking the question, is the difference between uh, group one and group zero between the expression significantly different from zero. And this is actually exactly the same as doing a two sample t-test. Uh, and um, so I'll be the, also introducing you to some potentially new terminology. So I'll be using the term parameters a lot in this talk. And parameters is just a collective term for these uh, betas, beta zero, beta one. Each of these is uh, known as a coefficient. So, but I'll be using the term parameters more frequently. So I mentioned that all of this is just essentially another way of doing um, what I imagine um, everyone has done before, which is a simple two sample t-test in, in Excel or GraphPad or whatever it is. So why do all of this? Why not just do t-tests? You could definitely just do t-tests um, but there are a few reasons. One is uh, a t-test is perfectly fine uh, for the most part for this kind of simple two-group comparison. But as we will see, um, 
this way of doing this kind of Excel approach to doing these comparisons, just doing a simple t-test starts to fall apart when you have more uh, complicated experimental designs. So that was why these linear models were proposed to, um, uh, why people thought of using these linear models to do this differential expression analysis. It's because they are flexible enough to accommodate pretty much any experimental design you can think of. And um, uh, I will show you what I mean um, when we go through the code, when we consider more complicated examples. Uh, the second uh, reason is it has to do with um, this, uh, this lemma package we're using. Um, so this lemma package, what it does, it's a package that allows us to specify and apply linear models to all kinds of omics data. Unlike simply just doing t-tests for all your genes, uh, what you can do is, uh, what uh, Lima allows you to do is, it allows you to compute what's known as a moderated t-statistic. Now, I said at the start of this um, VLE that I wouldn't go into the mathematical details of any of this, and I won't, but I think this is really worth mentioning. Um, so what is a moderated, so, so what does this mean? So this has the same interpretation as an ordinary t-statistic, except that the standard errors have been moderated across genes, meaning they've been squeezed towards a common value using a simple Bayesian model. And this is taken straight from the Lima guide. This is a lot. Um, essentially, what it means is, so if, when we are computing these t-statistics, which is what we uh, then use to compute our p-values, which is typically the end of uh, the, the sort of final goal of all of these analyses, um, it is crucial that we have a, a good estimate of the standard errors, right? Because that's what we use to compute these t-statistics. Turns out a naive computation of the standard errors just, that, uh, just derived from gene expression is not the best estimate of the quote real standard error. A better estimate is a weighted mean of these computed standard errors and a global standard error. Um, there's a lot of theory behind this uh, that is definitely beyond, beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but what I want you to know is, or remember is one, Lima just does this for you. So you don't have to worry about it. And two, by doing this just under the hood, it makes your statistical, it introduces a lot more statistical power. So this means you are much more likely to uh, identify real positives in your data. Um, so, and there's another quote from the Lima guide that I think is useful. Moderated t-statistics lead to p-values in the same way that ordinary t-statistics do, except that the degrees of freedom are increased. So this is another reason why um, uh, applying these uh, moderated t-statistics uh, increases the power of your uh, uh, approach. And this reflects the greater reliability associated with the smooth standard errors. So again, take home message is lemma equals flexibility plus power. So flexibility meaning really we can come up, it doesn't matter how complicated our experimental design is, uh, we can somehow come up with a model that can accommodate any amount of complexity. Uh, and um, so it's flexibility and it introduces power which is always a good thing. So uh, that's a quick fire introduction to linear regression, linear models in the context of uh, differential expression slash abundance analysis and a one page introduction to Lima. Now we get to the fun part of actually applying all of this to some example data. Now uh, in today's um, VLE, I will just be, uh, I'll be introducing three uh, expression matrices. Now, these are um, uh, fake data. Uh, and the reason I chose to do this was because I didn't want um, any uh, experimental, associated experimental details um, with real data uh, to, um, to, to distract us. And also typically with real data, we have thousands of rows, right? Because we have thousands of genes or thousands of proteins. Um, I wanted to keep it simple and ideally be able to fit all three data sets for all three examples just on a screen. So as you can see here, for the first example, we have our expression matrix, 
which uh, has 10 rows. So these correspond to 10 genes. I'm just calling them genes A, B, C, and so on, up to J. And then we have six columns. And these six columns correspond to six mice, from mouse one to mouse six. Um, so this expression matrix just, uh, and um, in the cells, imagine that there are expression values. So it just gives us the expression for a particular gene in a particular mouse. Um, along with this expression matrix, we also have these, what I'm calling pheno data frames, so phenotype data frames. And these data frames simply contain um, information, or you can think of it this as metadata about our columns. So crucially, when you look at the columns of the exp expression matrix, they should match the rows. So in our speak, the column names of the expression matrix should be identical to the row names of the pheno data frame. And we can see in this pheno data frame, we have some uh, useful information about these, in this case, different mice. Uh, it's just one new piece of information. It just tells us which group they belong to, in this case, control or treatment. But the great thing about this pheno data frame is you can have many more columns. Um, maybe one column is about sex, one column is about age, and so on. So right now, since this is the simplest possible example I can think of, where we're just comparing two groups, control and treatment, this is the minimum starting data you need to have to do the analysis. You need to have an expression matrix that looks like this, and you need to have a pheno data frame that looks like this. Now, um, speaking of new terminology, um, when you have uh, so uh, in this case, in this pheno data frame, this column, this treatment column is known as a factor. So a factor is a variable that can take on only uh, a few lab, uh, a few um, values. And these few a finite number of values are called levels. So we would say the treatment is a factor with two levels and the levels are control and treatment. And this is important um, because you will hear, or when you when you read more about um, these linear models, you will hear the terms factor and levels used throughout um, repeatedly. So it's important that you have a good understanding of what this pretty simple concept means. So that's it, factor and levels. So with all of that, um, so that's again, super quick fire introduction to all of this. Let's move on to the code and um, try to better understand um, how to do this uh, differential expression analysis. So I'm just going to escape this and move to our studio. So um, the, uh, like I said, um, no need for you to um, download the code now, but if you'd like to do it later on, um, the GitHub link can be found in the, the, in the description for this video. So the name of the particular file is this, this file called VLE underscore 11 underscore 14 underscore 2022. And it's an R Markdown file. So again, I'm going to assume that you have some familiarity with R and R Markdown. Uh, but um, if uh, there's anything about this that is uh, confusing or foreign, again, please feel free to ask questions, email me, um, whatever. So uh we have we'll do a couple of things um one thing is let's first go ahead and load the packages we need for today's session so if this is your first time seeing an R markdown file um it's pretty simple we have chunks here that we can enter and execute we can use to enter and execute our code and then we have um these other spaces here where we can just write like free text regular english so this first chunk has these two packages loaded. There's this package called tidyverse, which is what we'll use to kind of um, uh, do what's known as data wrangling, and um, Lima, which is the package that I just mentioned. And there's also commented code here, uh, in case you don't have these packages installed, just uncomment these lines, run them, and then you will be good to go. Um, so all of this is this today's VLE is really built on top of work done by others. Um, specifically, these three guides that I've mentioned here. The first one and the most authoritative is the Lima guide, specifically chapters eight, nine, and thirteen. And here they do a wonderful job of going through various real life examples of different uh, experimental uh, designs of different complexity. 
kind of like today's VLE and like a lot of other guides, they don't really go into the statistical details or the mathematical details. So if you want to really, really understand how this stuff or why this stuff is working the way it's working, um, I, I think the best option is to consult a biostatistician. But if you're interested in, simply interested in a practical application of these approaches, then this guide is, is fantastic. Uh, and unlike the three examples I will show today, this paper goes into many more examples. So maybe you have some kind of crazy time course, time series analysis. Um, uh, this, this paper covers even um, those kinds of complex designs. And finally, there's this really handy one page guide called Common Statistical Tests are Linear Models or How to Teach Stats. I mentioned in the case of simple linear regression with a categorical um, variable, so the two group comparison, that being identical to two sample t tests. This uh, guide shows you visually um, the relationship between linear models, linear, so linear regression, and other common statistical. Um, tests like the t-test or the um, non-parametric uh, t-test equivalent and so on. So I, I think that's a really nice, this is a really uh, useful guide. So those are the three guides that I would strongly recommend uh, if you want to get a good understanding of all of this. Um, and then we move on to creating our synthetic data. So since we have three examples, we'll be creating three fake expression data sets and three corresponding pheno files. Um, so if you want to run, so well, the first thing to do is to run all of this and to run all of this, you can just see this little um, green play button, we click play. And you can see when we look at our global environment, we now have three expression matrices, uh, matrix one, two, three, and three pheno data frames, pheno one, two, three. Um, so there's a lot of code I've written here to create these synthetic data sets. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to collapse it because I don't want it to distract us. Um, so we can go ahead and take a look at the first matrix. So for the first example, so this should hopefully look, um, let me increase the size of my screen. Oh, uh, actually, I think that's a little too big. Um, so this should look like the um, slide we just took a look at. So we can see we have six mice and we have 10 genes. Now, a couple of um, kind of technical details that are worth remembering. Um, one thing is to do lemma analysis, your, um, the object that contains your expression data has to be a matrix, um, which is what this is. And the uh, genes have to be rows, right? And so each gene has, and uh, where the uh, row names are the gene names, and the columns have to be samples, where the column names are the sample names. So pretty simple, this is our matrix. Oh, and one more thing, to um, use lemma, your input data have to be uh, log transformed. Um, it's a little bit more complex when we consider RNA-seq because RNA-seq are count data, but we'll set that aside for today. Assume that this is just uh, uh, microarray data. Um, so we have our matrix that looks like this, and I mentioned we also have a pheno data frame that simply looks like this. Again, note that the rows of this, the row names of this pheno data frame are identical to the column names of this um, uh, gene expression matrix. And then we have this one factor that we're calling treatment that has two levels, control or treatment. So this is what we use or will use to tell our, to tell Lima which groups we have and which samples belong to which groups. So, um, so this is, yeah, this is matrix one. Let's, um, so I made this uh, uh, matrix kind of, um, for the most part, I made it so that most of the genes don't show um, differential expression between the two groups, control and treatment, but a couple of them do. And I did this to show you that after we do, once we do the lemma analysis, um, we, uh, to convince you that Lima can in fact correctly identify the genes whose expression uh, is changing and identify genes whose expression is not changing as a result of treatment. 
So for the first thing, let's just plot the uh, expression for a gene uh, whose expression doesn't change um, as a result of treatment. So that looks like this. So there's this thing called gene H. And while there is a slight difference, um, it's not a very big difference. You can see that this is a expression for control, expression for treatment. They're pretty similar. Uh, let's now take a look at a plot for a gene whose expression does change, gene A. And so here you can see compared to gene H, gene A does show a very big difference in expression. Um, treatment seems to have uh, induced uh, an, in, an increase in expression of this gene. Cool. So those are, uh, this is what um, our data look like. And um, we've taken a look at a couple of plots. So now it says to go back to the slides. So now let's take a look at how to um, how to use lemma to quantify differential uh, to do this differential expression analysis. So there are a few steps here. So let's uh, let's go through them um, slowly and um, hopefully thoroughly. So we start off with our pheno data frame, which recall looks like this. It's pretty simple. We just have these six rows that correspond to our six samples. And then we have this treatment column that um, tells us which group which mouse belongs to. We use information from this pheno data frame in this function called model.matrix. And the name of the function is just model.matrix. And we use this, um, uh, this model formula uh, convention, the, this model formula. And um, a model formula always begins with a tilde, and then it's followed by the variable of interest. So in this case, it's just the treatment factor. What does this model.matrix tilde treatment do? It produces what's known as a design matrix. So it produces this thing here. What is a design matrix? A design matrix is what is used to estimate the values of our parameters. So what are our parameters in this case? Since it's a simple two group comparison, if you recall from a few slides ago, we're estimating two parameters, beta zero or beta naught and beta one. And so this matrix shows us uh, all these ones and zeros. They simply um, tell us which uh, group um, the, the mice belong to. So recall that beta zero is the mean expression in our control group, and beta one is the difference between the mean expression of control and treatment. And so the if there's a one followed by a zero, what that means is uh, just multiply the uh, parameter with that number. So for mouse one, it's beta zero times one, plus beta one times zero, which is just beta, one, beta zero. So that tells you that mouse one belongs to the control group. But if you look at like mouse four, it's beta zero times one plus beta one times one. So that means it belongs to the treatment group. Again, if this is your first time hearing all of this, it can seem a little, uh, it might be a little confusing. So all I can say is with repetition, um, uh, I believe that you will be able to convince yourself that this is actually uh, meaningful. It's just that there's a lot to remember when you when you first encounter this. Okay, so we use this model dot matrix and information from our pheno data frame to produce this design matrix. We then use the design matrix to fit a model and estimate the values of the parameters of that model. So what does that model look like? It will look something like this. Gene expression is equal to beta zero plus beta one times treatment. And again, just to remind you, beta zero is the mean of the control group. Beta one is the difference between the two groups. So what we will do with Lemma is we will take this uh, model and we will fit it to each gene. And this is where Lemma is amazing because it doesn't matter if you have 10 genes or 10,000 genes, Lima will just do it for you. We'll just fit these models separately. So what you get is, so in the case of 10 genes, you will have 10 models. And if you have 10 models, you will have 10 different beta naught and beta one values. 
different pairs for each gene. Um, and then what you do is you, for each gene, you can take your parameter of interest, which in this case is beta one, and do a t-test on it. And when I say you, Lemma has already done all of, will already do all of this for you. And so that's what you're using. That beta one is what you're using to compute the p-value that tells you, in this case, if there's a difference between control and treatment. And recall the treatment um, can take on one of two values, zero meaning control or one meaning treatment. So that is that. So what does this all look like in code? So if we go to line 192, uh, well, actually before that, this particular way of setting up a design matrix, this is called a, uh, this is called a mean reference model. <laughs> and there are two different ways of setting up these models. Um, I will go into, I'll show you how to do both and then compare and contrast and um, talk about why we even have these two choices, why one isn't simply good enough. Okay. So if we, we do this mean reference model. So uh, if we go to line 192, we do model.matrix tilde treatment. And where are we getting our treatment from? We have to specify, so I didn't show this on the slide, but in kind of real life, we have to specify where we are getting this treatment from. And we're getting it from pheno1, right? Because pheno1 has this treatment column. So let's run that. And let's save it as an object called design1a. Now, if we take a look at design 1a, we see that we get this design matrix that looks just like the design matrix we saw on the slide. We have six rows. So uh, don't uh, look at this ATTR stuff onwards. Uh, that's not relevant for today, the details. Just look at this part. We see that we have six rows corresponding to our six samples. And then we have two columns that correspond to the two parameters of this model, intercept and this treatment treatment. Um, R automatically names these columns for you. So one thing you will find is when you're making design matrices, um, they all typically end up having kind of silly column names. So you, a good idea is to rename the columns of a design matrix. So how do we do that? If we go to line 195, we know that the first parameter, our intercept, corresponds to the mean expression in the control group. So we can call it something useful like mean underscore control. And we know that the second parameter, that corresponds to the difference between our treatment group and our control group. So we can call it something like TRT versus control. Right? And we can assign that to the um, column names. And now when we look at it, we get something uh, so this design matrix, like I said, even without renaming the columns is perfectly usable and perfectly correct. This just allows us to keep better track of what these different uh, parameters mean. So that's how you make a design matrix using your pheno file. Pretty straightforward. Um, as in the code is straightforward, the um, understanding might not be. Um, so we go to line 198. We now have what we need to actually do the model fitting. So we, to do the fitting, we use this function called lmfit, comes from the lemma package. It takes in two um, arguments, uh, two uh, inputs. One is our expression matrix, matrix one, and it takes a design matrix, design one A. So let's run that and save it as an object called fit one A. The next step on line 199 is to apply this empirical Bayesian approach. And this is something that I touched on very briefly on one of the slides. And this is this step is doing that moderated T statistic computation. So all this is doing is um, increasing the power of um, the approach. So again, we don't have to really worry about the details. There's a function called eBase with a capital B. We apply it to this um, fit one A. And it just does this magic behind the scenes. And we can save that as another object called efit1a. And this is essentially all we need to do. Now we can extract, so it's, it's uh, fit the model. And we can now uh, fit the model to each of our 10 genes. So we can now look at the results table. 
And to do that, we use this function called top table. We do top table, we supply it with this efit1a object. And then we need to tell it what um, results table we want, meaning since we have two coefficients, we will have two results tables. So let's take a look at each one in turn and try to understand what the results mean. So there are a few ways of extracting the results for a given um, coefficient. One is to just remember uh, what each coefficient means uh, or is positioned. So we know that coefficient one is our mean control. Um, a more robust way is since our coefficients, we give our coefficients names, we can just refer to the coefficient by name. So mean control. We run this, we get our results table in the console that looks like this. Uh, one thing to say, this log full change um, uh, just, so it, the log full change, like that column name won't change depending on the, uh, um, the, uh, the coefficient you're looking at, but it's slightly confusingly, it might not necessarily mean log full change for every single coefficient, but the column name won't change. So what I mean by that is if we look at this mean control, what are these values in this log full change column? Well, these are simply the mean expressions of the genes in each, uh, in, of each gene in the control groups, right? And you see that all around one, because in the synthetic data set, I made it so that the mean expression for all the genes was around one. And if you look at the, um, let's, uh, another interesting column is the adjusted p-value. So this is the p-value you get after accounting for multiple comparisons, which is important. You can see that they're all tiny p-values. And why? Because this statistical test here is simply asking the question, is the expression of my gene in the control group significantly different from zero? And the answer is yes for all the genes. It's not an interesting question to ask. The more interesting question is uh, can be asked and answered by referring to the second coefficient, PRT versus control. If we run this results table, we now, if we look at this log FC column, we see that for most of these genes, the values are pretty low. And that's because I designed this, made this data set so that most of the genes, eight out of the 10 genes, there wouldn't be a significant difference. So if we look back at our plot, gene H, we see that it's a pretty low uh, number. And recall that this number here refers to the difference between the two groups, treatment and control. However, if we look at gene A, where there is a big positive difference, we see our model also correctly computes that there's a big positive difference. And just as importantly, when you look at the adjusted p-value for gene A, it's tiny. But if we look at the adjusted p-value for gene H, it's not significant. It's much higher. So this model has accurately uh, identify gene A as being significantly upregulated by the treatment uh, and gene H as uh, being not significantly affected by the treatment. So that's the, this is the simplest example of doing differential expression analysis using lemma. Okay, so I mentioned that this is one approach. It's called a mean reference model. There's a second, oops, there's a second approach. And this is, uh, again, from the, um, uh, from the paper that I recommended at the uh, start of this, um, this VLE. So if we look at the image, uh, the figure on the right, so that's the mean reference model. Again, look at the uh, model. Its um, expression is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 times. And in this case, they don't do control treatment. They do wild type and mutant. But anyway, beta 1 plus beta 2 times mutant. So again, here, what does beta one mean here? It means the average expression of a particular gene in, in this case, the wild type group. And beta two refers to the difference in expression between mutant and wild type. Therefore, beta one is the uh, mean expression in wild type and beta, so, oh, they made a mistake here. 
uh, I'm sorry. So they have beta one and beta two here, but on the uh, uh, figure on the y axis, they have beta naught and beta one. Sorry, this is confusing. Um, let's assume replace on the uh, y axis that uh, uh, replace the beta zeros with beta ones and the beta ones with beta twos. I'm so sorry about this. Um, anyway, so the mean reference model is the model we've been looking at so far. An alternative way of fitting uh, or constructing a model is to do one without an intercept. And I'll show you what that means when I run the code. When you do it without running the intercept, again, you get a model with two parameters. Uh, again, beta one and beta two, but they mean something different. So that's the means model here. Expression is equal to beta one times wild type plus beta two times mutant. Beta one in this case, actually beta one still means the same thing. It's the mean expression of the gene in wild type. Beta two, however, no longer refers to the difference in expression between mutant and wild type. In this model, it refers to the mean expression in mutant, right? So that's the difference between these two. It's a subtle difference, but important. Why do we, would we even want to use these two models? Um, why, why not just use one? In this very simple case, what is it that we're really interested in? where the thing that we're interested in computing is the difference between mutant and wild type. So our mean reference model directly gives us that information, the information that we're interested in, and that's simply beta two. The means model, however, does not give us that information. So we have to do some extra work and we'll, we'll take a look into what that, what I mean by doing extra work. So why would we want to choose a model um, strategy, so this means model, that means that we're doing extra work. Well, um, if we get uh, the identical output. Well, in this case, it's not worth doing the extra work, but I'll show you in the final example we considered today, why the means model uh, is a useful model to, to know about. Okay, so let's now go back to R and uh, fit this means model and compare it to our mean reference model. So we go to line uh, 204. Again, we do model.matrix, but instead of doing tilde treatment, we do tilde zero plus treatment. Otherwise, everything else stays the same. What does this zero plus treatment mean? Well, it means when we do zero plus, think of that as a zeroing out the intercept term. So this model will, the resulting model will not have an intercept term. So what does that look like? So we, we run this and we save it as an object called design 1B. And if we take a look at that design matrix, notice how this looks very similar to the previous design matrix. We have six rows corresponding to our six samples, and we have two columns corresponding to the two parameters. However, the ones and zeros are slightly different. And to show you, just um, in case you don't remember what the previous design matrix looks like, actually, let me clear up everything and just run it again. This is our previous design matrix. See, you just see ones running, uh, running down column one. It just contains ones. And then there are, in column two, there are zeros and ones. But if we look at the second design matrix, now we have either um, uh, one or zero in both the columns. And actually, if you look at the column names, uh, R is kind of telling you um, what these um, parameters mean. It's saying that this first one, treatment control, is the mean of expression in your control group. And this one is telling you that the second uh, column name is telling you that it's the mean of the treatment expression, um, the treatment expression group. Uh, so, so again, so this is our design uh, matrix. And uh, again, we can, if we go to line 207, we can uh, change the names of our columns so that there's something more meaningful, right? So I've changed them to mean control and mean treatment. It tells me that this first column corresponding to the first parameter of the model is my estimated mean expression in the control group. And the second one is the estimated mean expression in the treatment group. 
we go to line 210, we fit the models, the model in the same way. We apply empirical base in the same way. And we look up our results in the same way. So if we go back to uh, the previous model, right? Let's take a look at our first coefficient, which we call mean control. These are the values. Let's take a look at the first coefficient in our second model, so the means model. Oops. Notice, let me just make this bigger. The output for these two models for the first coefficient is identical, which from our slide, our previous slide, is what we expect, right? Beta 1 and beta 1. Beta 1 from the means model is identical to beta 1 in the mean reference model. They both correspond to the mean expression in your um, reference group. However, if you look at the second coefficient, which is in the first model is treatment versus control, and in the second model is mean treatment. And let me just clear this. So let's run the, look at the results table for the second coefficient of the first model. We get these. And let's do the same for the second coefficient of the second model. See, now you get different outputs. Look at the log FCs. They're completely different. Why? Because they mean different things. In this case, these refer to the differences between your two groups, which is what you're interested in. This just gives you the average in your second group, which by itself, I can't imagine is something of much interest. It's usually not something of much interest. So what do we do? We have our second model that has successfully computed the mean expression for all 10 genes in our control group and our treatment group. But we're not interested in either of those by themselves. What we're interested in is, in, is the difference. So how do we compute that difference? This is where contrast matrices um, become useful. So what's a contrast matrix? So this is our design matrix. We can see we have our rows that correspond to our samples, which there are six samples of so six rows. And then we have two columns corresponding to the parameters in our model, beta one and beta two. Notice here that um, both columns contain a mix of zeros and ones. So this is our means model, not our mean reference model. So again, beta one means corresponds to the mean expression in the first group and beta two corresponds to the mean expression in the second group. How do we compute the difference between those two? We can use this thing called a contrast matrix. A contrast matrix, its rows will be identical to the columns of the design matrix. Right, so you have beta one, B one, and B two in your design matrix, the columns, and the rows for your contrast matrix are also B one and B two. The columns of a contrast matrix specify what are known as contrasts, hence the name. And a contrast is simply a way of telling R how you want to take the parameters from your design matrix and combine them in a useful way. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the first contrast, which in this case they call C1. Notice that it has two numbers, one and minus one. What does that mean? All that means is we take our parameters, so B1 and B2, and we multiply it by the values in the contrast row uh, column, one and minus one. So B1 and B2 times, so it'll be B1 times one plus, b2 times minus 1. So that equals b1 minus b2. So that's the difference between the two groups. Um, and if you, so that's, that's kind of like doing control minus treatment. Conversely, if you wanted to do treatment minus control, you just change the signs. So you can have a second contrast, c2. You can have as many contrasts as you like. A second contrast, c2. So what does this mean? This means we take B1, multiply it by minus one, and then we add it to B2 multiplied by one. So that works out to B2 minus B1, or in our example, that's equal to treatment minus control.
That's a lot. Let's see what that looks like in code. So if we go to line 215, how do we specify a contrast? We can specify one or more contrasts using this function called make contrasts that comes from also the lemma package. So the way to do it is you specify first the, uh, the contrast. So in this case, and recall that to specify a contrast, you need to input your um, uh, uh, parameters from your design matrix, right? So the parameters from our design matrix are what? Mean treatment and mean control. And I want to work out the difference between them. So I simply do mean treatment minus mean control. And I give it a name. On the previous slide, we saw they called it C1, C2. That's not really meaningful. So you can call it something more meaningful. So I called it delta, which is meaningful to me because it means the difference between the two groups. And you also have to tell this make contrast function where you are getting these parameters from. And you specify that by uh, using this levels equals parameter. So levels equals design 1B. So you supply the name of the desired design matrix that you're using to this levels parameter. And we can save all of this as an object called, in this case, contrast one. Let's take a look at contrast one. Uh, actually, let me clear my screen again and take a look at it. Right, see now, how do we read this? We read this as, so we have two parameters and then we have these two numbers for one contrast. So we take our mean control multiplied by minus one and we add it to mean treatment multiplied by one. And that just results in mean treatment minus mean control. So how do we use a contrast matrix? We go to line 221. Uh, the steps are almost the same as before. We first fit the model. So we're using LM fit. We then do this thing called contrasts.fit. And contrast.fit takes first the output of LM fit and secondly, the contrast matrix. We save that as an object. And we apply empirical Bayes on that object as we're using eBayes in the same way we used it before. And that's it. And now we can extract the results table from this resulting object. Importantly, unlike in the previous two examples, this time when we're extracting the results table, there's only one coefficient and that coefficient is our contrast, right? So we can just do coef equals one. Let's take a look at this. This is the result of doing this. This, if we go back all the way to our first example, where we had the mean reference model and we extract the results table for TRT versus control, take a look at this results table so you can see all of these values. Let's look at that very first results table. They're identical. So whereas in the first model, the mean reference model, the second coefficient was the one of direct interest. And that's all we have to do. And we're done, we get our results, desired results. When we're using a means model, we have to do this little bit of extra work. We have to specify what's known as a contrast. So that is the simplest possible example of differential expression analysis. Let's now move on to a slightly more complex example. Uh, and we have half an hour to go, so we'll be able to get through this. Okay, so I mentioned, so in our first example, we have two groups, control and treatment. In our second one, we have control versus treatment one and treatment two. So again, this is a very um, realistic uh, experimental setup where you have, you have your control, and then you um, treat your mice or your cells or whatever with one or more um, drugs. So in this case, imagine we have two. So um, just as before, we have a, an expression matrix, which we're calling here matrix two. And this looks very similar to matrix one. It has the same number of genes, 10 genes, A to J, but it has a different number of columns. So now we have, instead of six mice, we have nine mice. And we have a corresponding pheno data frame, which again looks like our first one. 
uh, except it has a different number of rows. And so this uh, data frame tells you which group each sample belongs to. So we have three control samples, three treatment one samples called TRT1, and three treatment two samples. Let's now plot some of these data. So again, these are all clearly fake data, but I um, made these data so that in some cases, there would be a significant effect of treatment one, whereas in other cases, there'd be a significant effect of treatment two. And then finally, uh, cases where there'd be no significant effects of either treatment one or treatment two. What does that mean? So let's take an example. Look, take a look at an example of a gene whose expression is significantly affected by treatment one, but not treatment two. So if we plot that, we see for gene A, look at the expression between uh, for control and treatment two is approximately the same, but treatment one is is much higher. Conversely, if we take a look at gene C and plot its expression, we see the treatment one has no effect but treatment two does. So can we use lemma to um, identify these uh, effects? Yes, so let's see how we do it. Um, the first question to ask yourself here is, um, what do I use? Do I use a mean reference model or a means model? Um, in this case, the answer would be a mean reference model. Because imagine here, instead of uh, three groups, we just had two. What does a mean reference model tell us? It computes the um, mean expression in your control group and the difference between your control group and the second group. When you apply a mean reference model to this case where you have three, a factor with three levels, the first parameter, so you'll have a model with three parameters. The first parameter, your intercept, will still be the mean expression in your control group. The second parameter will be the difference between your control group and treatment one. And the third parameter will tell you the difference between the control group and treatment two. So typically, that's what people are interested in, differences between treatment one and control and treatment two and control. Now, if you wanted to do something fancier, not fancier, but you want to do something different, like work out the difference between treatment one and treatment two, or you could even do something like take the mean of treatment one and treatment two and work out the difference between that and the control group. Then you have to consider the pros and cons of using a mean reference model versus a means model. So since um, in this case, I'm say only interested in the difference between treatment one in control and treatment two in control, I will use a mean reference model. So how do I set that up? So on line 265, I do model.matrix tilde treatment again, data equals in this case, pheno two, right? Because it's the second pheno data frame and I save it as an object called design two. And if we look at design two, we see again, we have the same number of rows as we have samples. We have an intercept term. So this intercept term takes on the meaning of being uh, the mean of the expression uh, of uh, the control group. The second coefficient tells you the difference between the control group and treatment one. And the third coefficient tells you the difference between the control group and treatment two. Since I know that, I can give the, this design matrix more meaningful names. So now it's very clear from the column names what these different uh, columns mean. Now, one thing I'm sort of glossing over is how I know this stuff. Uh, a lot of this is because um, the Lima guide uh, and the, uh, the paper, the F1000 paper that I've been referring to, they both have um, a number of examples where they consider these specific, specifically these types of experimental designs. And so that guide, those guide, that guide and that paper are a really good resource if you are trying to decide how to set up a design matrix and just as importantly, how to um, uh, interpret the parameters of that design matrix. Uh, all of this is to say that 
in case in those cases where your experimental design is not covered by either the guide or this paper then it comes down you probably have something pretty complex so in that case it goes without saying but i'll say it please consult a biostatistician or a, an experienced computational biologist and at the very least they'll be able to tell you um, whether or not your interpretation is correct um, even if the details are a little um, too complicated. Anyway, so this design matrix, the parameters in this design matrix have this meaning. All right, so we've set up our design matrix again. Fitting the model is just as before. Applying empirical base is just as before. And now, if we want to extract our variables, uh, sorry, our results of interest, we do it the same way. We use this top table function, and then we specify the name of the coefficient of interest. So if you want to see all those genes whose expression, um, if you want to look at the difference in expression between your control group and treatment one, you would uh, indicate the coefficient of interest, run that. And if we look at this results table, we see uh, when we did treatment one, so gene A, treatment one has a significant effect. So we should see gene A up here and we do, right? It's one of two genes that has a very, very, very low adjusted p-value, whereas all the others. Whereas if we look at um, gene C, where it doesn't have a significant effect, where's gene C? C, it has a high p-value. So that's the treatment one effect. If we want to look at the treatment two effect, simple. We just replace the coefficient with the appropriate one. And uh, recall treatment two, gene C, it has a significant effect on gene C. And yep, that's our top candidate. Has a tiny adjusted p-value. Whereas it didn't apparently have any effect on gene A. Let's take a look at gene A. Yep, it's actually right at the end and has a huge p-value. Um, now, when you have these more complex setups where you have uh, uh, more than two groups, uh, there's a really nice function called decide tests. And you just, in this case, supply it with your fit object, this efit2 object, and you can save it as an, uh, an object called results2. And you apply the summary function to this. And this just tells you, this gives you a nice table that uh, quantifies the number of um, significantly and not significantly regulated genes. So we can see here clearly uh, TRT1 has a significant effect on two genes. That's because that's how I set up this table. And TRT2 also has a significant effect on two genes, but they happen to be two other genes, um, which is also expected. So that's applying Glimmer to now three groups. Let's end today's VLE by looking at a more complicated example. So um, in that complicated example, the expression matrix looks like this. So we have now 12 mice. We still have 10 genes, but we now have 12 mice, mouse one to mouse 12. And if we look at the pheno file for that um, expression, corresponding to that expression matrix, we see, again, we have 12 rows because we have 12 samples, but now we have three columns instead of one. We have a treatment column, which in this case has two levels, either control or treatment. We have a genotype column that is uh, weight, uh, sorry, weight. This is either wild type or knockout. And then we have this combined or concatenated column. Now, why did I concatenate these two? And again, the, um, okay, uh, for one thing, if we have this treatment and genotype, what is it that we're really interested in? There are lots of questions we could ask. We could ask, well, is there a difference? What is the difference in expression between uh, treatment and control just for wild type? What is the difference in expression between treatment and control just for knockout? Uh, what is the difference of differences? Meaning, let's say treatment has an effect in your wild type. It also has an effect in your knockout, but its effect is twice as potent. That might be something uh, interesting to know. How do you identify something like that? So given that these are some of the many things, comparisons we might be interested in, the easiest way to uh, construct a design matrix for this, and then uh, subsequently a contrast matrix to extract these comparisons of interest 
is by combining these two columns. Again, how do I know that? Because there is an identical example in the Lima guide and an identical example in the F1000 research paper. And the strategy they recommend is doing this concatenation. Could you um, design, uh, come up with another design matrix and contrast matrix that doesn't require this concatenation? Definitely. But this is the easiest approach. How do you know it's the easiest approach? And like, how do you find these easiest approaches? Again, please refer to the guide or that paper for most cases. So, okay, so now we have a complex, um, a really complex setup. We have two factors, each of which have two levels, right? So let us look at the expression of a given gene, let's say gene C. And we see that uh, it is not particularly different. Its expression is not particularly different between control and treatment for both knockout and wild type. But one thing to notice here is that generally speaking, wild type has a lower expression, irrespective of treatment type, than knockout. And so that's something you would probably want to take into account, this uh, genotype effect. So anyway, we have this expression pattern for a particular gene. And let's look at the, uh, the expression pattern for another gene. Let's say gene A, and this is very different. In this case, there's clearly an induction of expression by our treatment in both knockout and wild type. But importantly, there's also a differential induction. We see that although this expression is induced in wild type, it's much more potent in the knockout. And you know, if this was some kind of drug, this would be really important information to know. And given that in real life, you have thousands of analytes and comparisons to look at, how do you, in a principled, um, effective way, identify these kinds of um, patterns without actually plotting, uh, you know, 10,000 plots? We can use Lima for that. So those are our two genes. Oh, and I have another gene that expression pattern. Okay. And then we have a, a third scenario where, again, we have clearly an induction of expression by treatment, but it's the same for both knockout and wild type. So that's a subtle difference between uh, gene A and gene B. So how can we use Lima to pull out all these various um, interesting, identify all these various interesting patterns? As always, we begin with the design matrix. So on line 343, Again, we use our model.matrix function. And here, what I'm doing is, recall that I have a column where I've, that contains the information that is, uh, that is uh, a combined version of these two factors. So that's what I'm supplying. And I want this to be an intercept-free model, meaning I want to make a means model. Again, why? Because it'll make downstream uh, subsequent analysis easier. So let's make the design matrix first and then talk about why we made this particular design matrix. So we do that and then we need to specify where we're getting this combined factor from, pheno3, right? So we make that design matrix and let's take a look at it. I clear my console. This is pretty complicated looking, but it's not too bad. We see here we have 12 rows corresponding to our 12 samples, and we have four columns, which means that our resulting model has four parameters that we're trying to estimate. And if you look at this, you see that no single column just contains uh, ones, meaning that we can tell straight away that this model doesn't contain an intercept. What does that mean? So that means then that each column represents the means of the four levels of this combined category. Now this combined category has four unique levels, control wild type, treatment wild type, control knockout, treatment knockout. And what this design matrix 
is um, trying to do is we are trying to use it to estimate these four parameters. So the means of these four groups, the four groups being control wild type, treatment wild type, control knockout, treatment knockout. And since I know that uh, on line 346, I can just change the names of the design matrix and take a look at it again. And now it has the names are more meaningful to me of these four parameters. So I'll go ahead and fit this model on line 348. Now I have the means of these four groups. None of these coefficients by themselves or none of these parameters by themselves are meaningful to me. However, I can use these parameters to compute things of interest. How? By specifying contrasts. So if I look at line 349 in the make contrast function, I can do things like this. So in this case, I'm only specifying three contrasts. Like I said, you can specify however many contrasts you're interested in. So the first contrast, which I'm calling TRT versus con WT, I take this treatment wild type parameter and I subtract the control wild type. And this has the effect of looking for differences between treatment and control just within the wild type group. Similarly, if I want to look at differences between treatment and control just within a knockout, I can create this contrast here. And finally, if I want to look at this, I mentioned this difference of differences, I can do this and I can call it diff. And this third contrast will pick up patterns like this. It'll give me a significant value for some, for a gene that has an expression pattern that looks like this. So that's that contrast matrix. And if we look at the contrast three, you can see um, the, uh, the values of the contrast matrix show you how these four different parameters are combined. So our first contrast, we're just interested in the difference between treatment and control just for wild type. So notice how the, uh, the parameters that correspond to our knockouts, they're just zeroed out. So then we can um, use this contrasts.fit function, empirical base, just like before, we can do that. And now we can use top table to extract our comparisons of interest. So let's look at the first uh, contrast. So that's treatment versus control wild type. So this is looking for differences, uh, significant differences in the wild type group. So it tells me the gene A is significantly different for wild type. I'm looking at gene A right now. It looks like it's significantly different. If I look at the second KO, well, actually, so wild type, it tells me both gene A and gene B, those are the only two with significant differences, uh, significant p-values. So we see gene A, gene B for wild type, gene A for wild type, looking good. Let's take a look at knockout, run that. Again, it gives me a very similar output. It tells me gene A is significantly different and it all, so tiny p-value, and it also tells me the gene B is significantly different, tiny p-value. But from these two, it isn't immediately obvious. It kind of looks like um, the treatment is having the same effect on genes A and B in both knockout and wild type. And this is where the third contrast, this difference of differences contrast, this is where, this is what will tell us um, that although gene A and gene B, their expression is, uh, expressions are both induced by treatment in both knockout and wild type. In, uh, in the case of gene B, the level of induction is the same, uh, irrespective of genotype. But in the case of gene A, there's a differential, a differential effect between knockout and wild type. How do I know that? If I look at the results table, the only gene with a significant p-value is gene A. Whereas gene B, we go all the way down, it has a really high p-value. So that's what this diff um, contrast is telling you. 
So with that, uh, I think I'm done. Um, I hope this was useful. Uh, again, um, please uh, um, email me with any follow-up questions you have. Uh, I appreciate that this was a lot, um, but uh, uh, I, I, I hope it was useful. And um, so, as I said, the code is available on GitHub. So I recommend really, as is the case with all of these things, to really develop a good understanding or at least decent intuition for what's going on is to just go through these examples yourself. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, applying this to real data and want to know a way you can actually find all of these data, again, please email me. Um, there's a really good resource called the Gene Expression Omnibus that has thousands of studies. Um, so you can actually apply this to real data and you can see how, hopefully if other people have made their code available, you can see how um, people have analyzed their own data to learn how to specify these design and contrast matrices. But uh, with that, um, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, thank you, Daniel, for all your help.